Welcome to Vicinities Europe, the first pan-European current affairs talk show, presented today by Tim Judah and Susan Nadeau. Hello and welcome to our show. We gather guests from different countries and backgrounds to discuss the issues of importance to the people of Europe. Today we have a very important one. We're going to discuss the migrant and refugee crisis here in Europe. Well, as we all know, this has become a highly charged and uh, complex issue for the whole of the continent. And um, our guests have several different perspectives, experiences and insights to share with us. So let's welcome our guest. First, we have Professor Philippe Farg. Refugee crisis has become an overwhelming concern for European citizens. And as an academician, I consider my duty to inform uh, the public about what I know and to listen uh, to public opinions in our countries. Timea Kovac. This is not your choice to leave your born country. I think uh, I have to give all the support for the people who came uh, illegally to the country and they should leave them country because of real danger. Dr. Milita Shunic. Uh, as humanitarians, we can help refugees with their most urgent needs. Uh, we can alleviate their situation. But behind every humanitarian crisis, there's a political problem. So the solution is never with a humanitarian organization, but with politics. And uh, finally, Vasilis Tsartsanis. I want to talk about the emptiness of the reaction of the European authorities and also the emptiness of every international organization for two years and a half in Idomeni and allow this humanitarian catastrophe and the mafia and allow the mafia to be states inside of states in the middle of heart of Europe. And also what I believe about the new hotspots. I'd like to take this opportunity as well to welcome our audience. We have uh, several from the European Alternatives Network. We have alumni from the European Fund for the Balkans. And uh, we have students that are part of a dual master's program with the University of Belgrade and the University of Graz. First of all, we'd like your opinion and to ask you all to answer the following question on the tablets that are being um, uh, passed around. Should the EU accept all those refugees who meet asylum requirements? Yes or no? Well, there's a lot to consider here. Children, deaths, security concerns, cultural changes. Uh, but what is sure is that the number of people making the dangerous journey into Europe is uh, shocking. And uh, th their stories can be heart-wrenching. But the issue is, at a fundamental level, uh, certainly opening up some very deep fractures uh, within Europe. We have some videos to share um, and some photos to share that were taken by one of our guests, Vasilis Zartsanis, who's a filmmaker, uh, as well as um, Alexander Milanovic. So let's take a look at, uh, at this first video. By the end of 2015, a million people are expected to have applied for asylum within the European Union, and half of them can expect to qualify. There could be millions more coming too. The great majority of these people have come through Turkey, from Syria, where war rages on. As we see almost daily, this is a horrible journey. Thousands have drowned on their way and others have died in trucks or even attempting to get to Britain through the Channel Tunnel. All of these people are aiming to get to Germany, Scandinavia and other northern European countries in the hope of finding either a safe haven or just a job. Two of our guests, um, uh, uh, Vasilis Hassanis and Timea uh, Kovac, um, you both live on uh, either ends of the part of this uh, corridor that people have been transiting through in the Balkans. Uh, um, Timea in, in, in Hungary and uh, Vasilis in, in Greece. And you've got quite direct hands-on experience. Perhaps I could ask you to share some of your stories, uh, both of you. Perhaps you'd like to start, uh, Timea. I have so many experiences. And uh, I don't know that uh, the last one was just uh, since uh, the law has changed. Uh, probably you know that from the 15th of September, uh, could it, uh, it uh, changed very serious way. So if someone came through to the borderline at Serbia, from Serbia, in this part of the country, uh, they, uh, it, it, may, it, may, it, uh, it means that they made a criminal because they came through the defense. So first they get in, uh, uh, I'm just talking about a Serbian family, 
just want to make a quick clarification. It's a Syrian family of... Yes, of course. Who has the Kurdish nationality, so they came from, they, they came from Kobani, and they came from a real danger. They left them home just 10 days, uh, 15 days before, and uh, they came through the borderline to the fence. Uh, they got in a uh, real problem in Hungary because started the criminal case, started immigration uh, procedure, started, uh, and uh, they, of course, they are a real, real asylum seeker, and they seek asylum as well. And uh, now, they, uh, since they arrived to Hungary, they are detenting in a cab with look, the children. And how did it affect the children? Did you see the children? How old yeah, were they? Yeah, of course. Uh, how does it affect them? Of course, they are very worried. They are uh, crying, so they are in a close place. They are almost two weeks, uh, since two weeks, they are detending. They couldn't get out to the uh, street. They are, uh, couldn't buy anything. They just have what they take with themselves and what they, the authority, the government uh, give them. Uh, Vasilis, perhaps you'd like to share, what's the most striking experience that you've taken away recently in the last few weeks uh, from the crisis? The last few weeks, if we are going to talk, we will lose uh, what happened in Tidomeni. In Tidomeni, we have to talk about what happened the, two, the last two years and a half. The emptiness of the reaction of all the international organizations. We'll, we'll get to that, but, but give us an experience, just a human experience, just to start off uh, at this point. But we will get to that. I met only people to bleeding, under of the beating of mafia. Every day in Tidomeni, we had more of 150 people victims under of mafia. So just to say only good stories about this and lose what happened in Idomeni with this humanitarian catastrophe and this daily crime, we will allow again everyone to create again these criminal holes. So in Idomeni, what we have as an experience, the residents and me, it's every day daily crime against of refugees. Bleeding, beating them, robber them, keep them as hostage. Ro uh, robber them and uh, rape them in some cases and also we have many deaths and many people suicide up on the train tracks. So that's the, the situation in Idomeni all of this period for two years and a half. Even the European Union, even the European Commission, even every international uh, organization never came in the area the two years and a half. That's my experience on the area. I feel sadness until now. Very difficult situation and... Just to start, we'll get back to you, but just to start, let's take a step back. Uh, Professor Philippe Farg, uh, you've written many policy papers and articles on migration and refugee issues in, in Europe over the past three years, you said. Um, also looked at what Europe does and does not do in the countries of first asylum as well. Can you, can you tell us a bit about this? Yes, let me just start with numbers. There are 20 million refugees in the world today. 15 million under the mandate of UNHCR and five millions under the mandate of UNRWA, the Palestinian Refugee Organization. Out of these 20 million refugees, 10 million, 50%, live in the Middle East and North Africa, and mainly in the Middle East, which is a region that Europe considers to be its neighborhood. So 50% of the world refugees live in EU's neighborhood. What does Europe do? A lot of things. Uh, Europe is the first by very far source of financial aid to refugees in this part of the world and worldwide. But uh, it is not sufficient to provide money to people. Uh, what Europe does in terms of welcoming the refugees is another story. Uh, it is another story. Let's compare Europe with those countries of first asylum. In Lebanon, for example, you have 1.2 million refugees out of a population, a national population, of 4.5 million, meaning that one-fourth of the population is made of refugees. In Jordan, if you add the Palestinian refugees, the Syrian refugees, the Iraqi refugees, you have two-thirds of the population that is a refugee population in protracted refugee situation. In Turkey also, you have a huge number, two million. So what happens today? Today, uh, we have seen the situation of many refugees in these countries deteriorating. So people tried to reach Europe because it was no longer sustainable in these countries. So we have to be aware of this. The roots of the current refugee crisis are in Europe's neighborhood. 
Uh, Milita, I see you nodding that. Can, I, I think you had something to say about it as well. Yeah, what, what I see in this crisis is that, that people, also politicians, somehow zoom on one crisis spot or on one country, on the, on, on, on the law of, of one country like in Hungary. But we have to see the whole picture. These people are fleeing more and more areas in Syria are not sustainable. People have to leave them. When they see in the neighboring countries, which Philippe already explained, the, the humanitarian operations are underfunded there. We cannot guarantee the minimum to meet the minimum needs in these countries. And of course, if I'm a refugee fleeing from Aleppo today and I can see that people suffer in the neighboring countries because there's not, mu not enough aid for them, of course I'll go further. And this is what is happening. And Europe's reply has been that country by country they say, okay, let them come, but not to me, instead of coming, uh, instead of responding with a, with a holistic approach. Mm -hmm. So generally the situation is that Europe could have planned better for this. They could have seen what Philippe is saying, they could have seen what was going to happen and come up with Well, <laughs> the situation today is changing in Europe. As we have seen, Germany uh, said, you're welcome. Uh, there are many said that at, at the beginning. So uh, something is changing, and uh, whatever the reason, probably the media uh, took a big role in this, but things are changing. But also we know that uh, a U-turn is always possible. And um, on one side, one country has been welcoming more people, but on the other side, many borders have been closed, fences uh, have been constructed, so uh, we, ha we have to watch. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, well, the um, audience results of our first question have been tallied. Uh, just to remind you, should the EU accept all those are refugees who meet asylum requirements? And uh, the results are, well, as you can see, a resounding yes, 69.6%. And, uh, well, almost a third, on the other hand, are saying, uh, uh, saying no, which is quite interesting. Well, I uh, hope that among those who said no, there are no law students. Because Europe is, by international law, by its own law and by national law, bound to give asylum to those who meet asylum criteria. It's not a choice. It's an international obligation. Good. Well, OK, well, I'm, but I'm going to ask uh, Jackson Oldfield here. He's from the uh, from European Alternatives Network. Uh, friend, you're from, from Britain. Um, what was your answer and uh, how do you explain uh, the, the, these uh, results? Um, yeah, I mean, I voted yes. Um, and, yeah, it's a shame that we don't have more consensus on this because I believe not only do we have a, a moral obligation as fellow human beings, but also we know that since the 1950s we've had a legal obligation to accept refugees in Europe. Um, and I think the question should be, should be not whether we accept refugees, but how do we ensure that people can claim asylum um, safely in Europe? Thank you. Let's look at the next question now for our audience. Sorry, Philippe? No, no but, but sorry, I have a comment. To sorry, make sorry, here. no, go ahead. Sorry, yes, sorry, yes, please, I go want ahead. to make a comment because sorry. the question was, sorry. Uh, should Europe accept all those who meet the criteria for asylum? Yeah. That is not the right question. Should Europe accept all those meeting the right criteria and putting a claim in Europe, that is the right question. And then it should be 100% yes, because there is no question. Europe must, as it was said. But of course, Europe is not receiving all the asylum claims. And that is important, I think, because many people would like to put a claim for asylum in Europe, but they can't, because you must be on the territory of Europe. So what do they do? They take risks for their lives. They cross the sea in order to reach our territory. So that is the real point, you know? Well, I take your point, but as you saw, not everybody uh, thinks it is the... Not everybody agrees, though. So. No, the uh, question should have been all those which, reaching the territory of Europe. And then it is no longer a question because it's a legal obligation and, and full stop. Uh, Vasilis, I think you had a comment on that. Go ahead. Yes, I said also Denmark now starts to deport the people, and even if they are Syrians, to send them back in Hungary. So it's a threat. We have another question for the audience, uh, and we'll move on as well. Uh, should the EU sponsor more monitoring and rescuing of people at sea? You've got your uh, tablets there, so please uh, answer the question, and uh, we'll have the results in uh, a few minutes. OK, well, we've um, touched on some reactions of some governments. Uh, here are a few more examples. We're going to see the video now. With more than 9,000 people crossing the border on some days, Hungary has erected a razor wire fence on its border with Serbia. 
which it is now extending to the frontier with Croatia. Britain and France have beefed up security at the entrance to the Channel Tunnel, patrolling with sniffer dogs and extending fences to keep migrants and refugees out. Bulgaria protects its border with Turkey with a major fence more than 100 kilometers long. Now, we've had the EU agreeing to the uh, mandatory distribution of uh, some 120,000 refugees. Uh, and, but we've seen there's been quite a lot of resistance in uh, several countries uh, to that. And it's not clear that uh, people all over Europe uh, want uh, refugees, even if they have a legal right, even if they have a legal right to, to stay. And I'm wondering whether there's an elephant in the room which is perhaps politically incorrect to ask uh, or to talk about, which is perhaps the, the real issue is that many of them are Muslims, uh, many of them are, are Arabs. And I think this is something which we have to talk about because these are the concerns of many people in Europe. And perhaps uh, if we don't take those concerns into, into, into uh, consideration... Uh, then perhaps the result is that we get uh, uh, anti-immigrant parties are, are rising across Europe like uh, UKIP in Britain, the National Front in France or Golden Dawn uh, in Greece. Do we need to talk about this? Should we talk about this? What's your reaction? I think we must talk about this. We must talk about this. Uh, of course, uh, uh, taking refugees in also implies that we have integration policies as soon as these people are not expected to be able to return to their country uh, in, 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 the, in the coming months. So we have to integrate the people. And I strongly believe that uh, our societies, our values, are strong enough to integrate other religions. That is my... Okay. Melita? Well, if... In, in a way, it's a no-brainer. If I don't want refugees to come to Europe, then I have to give them an alternative which they don't have at the moment. They cannot stay in Syria because war is going on and, I, and, and it won't. this is the source of the problem and we need to tackle the source, which cannot be done by humanitarian organizations like mine, but which needs to be done by politics. The other thing is most of the refugees are in the vicinity of Syria and the operations there are underfunded. So if I want people to stay there, I have to give them a livelihood, which is not happening at the moment. A few months ago, World Food Programme had to cut food rations for these people. So first of all, I need to help the people where they are. Refugees also usually want to stay closer to home because that's where they, they understand their culture, they understand the language. As much as you say that Europeans feel that the Arab culture is too, too, too far from, from their own, Arabs, it would be easier for an Arab who, who, who has a, 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 a diploma, who learned something, who has a profession to work in a country where they speak his own language. But you have to give them a livelihood. And then you will, and, but those refugees who come to Europe, for those we need um, fair and efficient asylum procedures, we need to integrate them and we need to give them an integration problem, uh, program and the possibility to start a new life. Fine, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm just asking the questions, I'm just clarifying that. But uh, in both of your countries, there's been quite a strong reaction against uh, refugees and uh, migrants. First of all, in Greece, because we live with Arabs thousands of years, the solidarity of the Greeks to the Arabs and the same culture with Arabs, music, food, it's very similar. So I will tell you about my area. For more than two and a half years, the refugees are with us. They are staying in our homes. People help them. They didn't rob no one. They didn't touch no one. But I want to return a little back and say, we are in Serbia, in Belgrade, and we know what happened here before some many years with NATO. NATO also, again, destroyed Syria, Iraq, Libya. Nobody knows who is going to be the next. So the problem is for the countries, for the Western countries, to destroy it, the Middle East, and then they have xenophobia and they don't accept people. As England, they will save people at the sea, but they will not accept the refugees in their land. So what do we have to say? The major problem is to stop the NATO to bombing again 
Middle East and will not reborn again any more refugees. Timur, what do you think? I think uh, this is not a choice to be, to be a refugee, to, to become a refugee. So we must uh, support them where they are. So if they are in Hungary, for example, we must give them the legal assistance, the, the opportunities to guarantee everything. So uh, we try to help for them to integrate it. Yes. It, it, I don't think that it uh, depends on the past. Yeah. We are now living in, the, in, the, in these days. Sure. So if there are more Muslims, we must help for them to integrate, not to change the religion, just only to live uh, together with a normal life. I would like to add something. Please. What we see and what we read in the newspapers is, is, is the discussions, the anti-refugee discussions that are popping up and the far-right parties who have their anti-refugee um, ret rhetorics. But I've been, I've been working with these people in, in, in several countries and at the same time they are carried by a wave of solidarity. I was in Horgos when the Hungarian police fired tear gas at them. 50 meters further inland, there was a Hungarian NGO giving out hot meals. I see these people, young people, even last weekend at the, at the, at the Serbian-Croatian um, border, I saw young people coming from Austria, coming from the Czech Republic, who are bringing in food and clothes and who want to help. So it's not true that it's only... only um, an anti-refugee feeling. On the contrary, there's a lot of civil society movements and even individuals doing, uh, going out of their way to help these people. And I understand what you said too about, uh, uh, about things popping up in the media, in the, the right-wing media, but sometimes it comes across in, in, in more mainstream media as well, that there are security issues. How, how do we handle this on borders so that the right people get the, the right help that they need? Well, what should happen is that people who reach EU territory, which means Greece, the moment they reach EU territory and they want asylum, the EU has an obligation to give them an asylum procedure. They have a right to an asylum procedure. Not necessarily to asylum, this will be shown Shall in the procedure, but to a procedure. And since Hungary cannot meet this requirement, the EU should not allow or force these people to use all sorts of informal uh, and difficult ways to cross non-EU countries to get into the EU again and to be fenced off in the end. But there should be a relocation plan. It should be done in an organized manner, which would also cut out smugglers and, and, and organized crimes and uh, enable these people to move on in Europe in dignity, uh, their cases to be looked at, and then a regular decision to be taken. Then we wouldn't have all these irregular entries and these people moving through Europe like a marathon. Uh, Tim, perhaps I'd like to, to, to ask you something, because uh, you mentioned earlier the fence and uh, how difficult it was. At the same time, uh, refugees and migrants are crossing unhindered in other parts of the border. I mean, how, how, how do we explain this, that uh, one part... You can't cross and there's police and uh, offence and in other parts there's, you can. Which is I very think odd. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, shouldn't happen because uh, in one part of the country they get, a, they, they, they get in a criminal case and the other part at Croatia they are uh, organising uh, by the government to go through the, the borderline. So I really don't understand how is it could happen. It's a sort of microcosm of Europe as a whole, isn't it? It's just like... Uh, it's a, a small version of Europe as a whole, and it's like different policies at different times in different places, perhaps. It is uh, happening in Hungary that uh, yeah. they use different law, actually. So, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but as a, as a lawyer, when you bring this up, what do people well, say? Well, uh, when I was in, a, in, a, in this, when I represent this family in front of the court, and I uh, try to explain to the, court, to the jury that uh, what's happening here in this part of the country and what's happening... In day by day in the other part of the country that is not, uh, not it not give us the people that uh, Hungary use the law uh, like they should use and uh, well what we saw that uh, the jury is not interested in uh, they told that uh, the, here is a fence this fence declared that uh, in this part of the country no one could be allowed uh, just only on the transit zone yes uh, not through the fence in a hall, but uh, the only thing is what we can do to apply because of the decision, but actually we don't have the endless decision 
Uh, but uh, what, as I told that the family is detending in the asylum procedure, so uh, we are waiting for the endless decision. Defense makes mafia to be grown and grown and create states inside of states. Half million euros every day, the daily profit from our borders. Two million euros from Kumanovo to Serbia. And two million euros daily profit to pass in Hungary. Who is going to stop this? It's huge money. Everybody slept. Everybody takes benefits from the refugees. Everybody says about the new spots, the hot spots. It will be the, the hostel for mafia. It's enough with this hypocritism, also for the European, also for us. It's the same also for the Greek state. So what is your solution? Everybody to pass from Turkey to Greece, from Evros, from the land. Huge registration center there. And then Europe has to be in front of their responsibilities to see what they are going to do now, not tomorrow, and not under of the steps of mafia. What we did now, we make an unofficial way of the refugees under of the mafia to be the official way for all of the refugees to go in Hungary. This is something that presumably you spend your whole life studying. Well, how do you react to it? My whole life, but, but I understand the problem is uh, with Greece also. Uh, being left alone by Europe. <laughs> so uh, now this um, plan to uh, have a fast uh, examination of the situation of refugees in the so-called hotspots, where in less than three days you should make a decision of whether rejecting the person or accepting that that person will uh, file a claim that is, uh, that is something that is accompanied with relocation of the people. Relocation of the people in several parts of Europe. So Europe is now reaching that step which should probably uh, partly address your concern. But it will not address another, another point which is reaching the hotspot. Reaching the hotspot is dangerous. And I want to insist on this if we continue to have only the possibility for applying to asylum in Europe, once you reach the territory of Europe, then reaching the territory of Europe will continue to be extremely dangerous. So that is also the problem we must have now, and we, are, we have been claiming this for now years, we must have possibilities in embassies, in the countries of first asylum, in EU delegations in these countries to provide uh, refugees with asylum visas or humanitarian visa or student visa or family reunion visa or whatever visa you want. But avoiding that all these people will converge at the risk of their life to Greece or Malta or Italy. So that is the responsibility of Europe should be, uh, uh, should be considered before reaching Greece. It has to be considered in the countries of first asylum, and I repeat, in Lebanon, in Turkey, in Jordan, but also in other parts of the world. Now we must, that exists in European law. We must use it. We must use the possibility we have to have uh, asylum <coughs> visas. I just wanted to ask uh, Melita, can something like this, though, happen fast enough? Yeah. Well, um, UNHCR has been asking for exactly that, for legal avenues to reach Europe. The more you make a, 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 a fortress out of Europe, the more you strengthen uh, illegal migration, the more you strengthen also uh, smuggling networks. And, and the more you also have a, in a way now, those refugees come who can afford to come and the poorest of the poor who might have the same uh, reasons to claim asylum are, are stuck in, in refugee camps close to Syria. So this is, uh, we need legal avenues for these people to come to Europe, but also we need a political solution to the conflict because as long as we have wars and conflicts, as long as we don't have uh, international mechanisms to, to uh, appease the situation, people will come. Should the EU sponsor more monitoring of the seas where migrants typically cross into Europe? 84.4% said yes, 15.6% said no. Okay, let's go to the surgeon. 
Yeah, my answer was definitely yes, especially having in mind all these terrible tragedies happening actually every day now in the Mediterranean on the shores of Italy, Libya, Greece, Turkey and so on. And it seems that the route won't change, that people will continue to come to Europe across the sea. So I believe it is a very important question. It's quite urgent. But also the big question is who is capable of conducting such missions, right? So search and rescue at sea is approved by European citizens. And they are just right to do so. What would happen if we don't do it? What would happen? I will tell you, people will stay in Libya. They are refugees in a country which is a complete chaos today. Thanks to NATO, you said it. Thanks to NATO, it is a complete chaos. They would be imprisoned in Libya. That is absolutely not what uh, European values would recommend. So that is right to say yes. Mm -hmm. And there is no other choice. And Italy understood that now years ago, that they continued this Mare Nostrum uh, operation while... Uh, they were due to discontinue it. They've just continued because you cannot leave the people at the mercy of uh, all the militias in Libya. Okay. Yeah. I think Vasilis wanted to comment as well. We'll get to you next. I want to ask UNHCR, did you hear the last two months Frontex is attacking to the refugees in the middle of sea and robber them? 26,000 euros only from one balloon boat. And every day are reports from the refugees while Frontex is attacking to them, destroyed the boats in the middle of sea and stole the, uh, the cell phones and the money. Are someone is going to start the researchment about Frontex? I have not heard that. It's the first time I hear it, but maybe we can discuss afterwards and follow up. Uh, this is another question for, for the audience. Uh, uh, is the EU capable of carrying out uh, a cohesive plan uh, to deal with the refugee and uh, migrant crisis, uh, yes or no? We've heard a lot about the tragedies and we have uh, another video with some more, some more examples. It's hard to comprehend the daily tragedy. One fateful day in April, 700 died when a boat sank in the Mediterranean. More than 70 bodies were found decomposing in a truck abandoned on an Austrian highway. Others have died trying to get through the Channel Tunnel on foot. A photo of a three-year-old boy washed up on a beach in Turkey was published around the world. Oh, yeah. Um, Recently, I spoke with Gerald Knaus. He heads the European Stability Initiative think tank. Uh, They have published a policy paper recently uh, with a plan that they think will stop the chaos and address the humanitarian concerns. If we, look at, if we look at how to regain control of the border in the G, it is not Greece that can do anything. I mean, Greece, according to international law, any refugee, any boat that arrives in Greek waters on a Greek island, Greece has to take. Greece cannot push them back. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, Turkey cannot stop them leaving Turkey. I mean, this is also, the, the Turkish Coast Guard is trying. It's not that they don't look. But if the Coast Guard is looking at one boat, another 20 leave in the same time. So the only way to solve this is if Greece and Turkey reach an agreement whereby Greece declares Turkey a safe third country. And Turkey said that anybody who reaches the Greek islands is not taken to the Greek mainland, but Turkey accepts them officially back. Mm -hmm. Now, the only way this can be done is if there are two preconditions. One is that the people that are taken back from Greece to Turkey can then apply for asylum in Turkey. And secondly, that Turkey is not left alone by the European countries with two million refugees from Syria who are registered. I mean, alone carrying the whole burden. (laughs) So this is why what we are recommending is that some EU member states led by Germany make Turkey an offer. And the offer would be that if Turkey permits from a certain date, very soon, let's say 5 October, 10 October, to take back anybody who after that date reaches the Greek islands. In return, Syrians resident now or registered in Turkey can apply and 500,000 will get asylum in Germany, which would then allow the Turks and the leaders in Turkey to go to their own citizens and say, for those who will stay in Turkey, we can in turn 
open the labor market, allow them to work, and give them a perspective here. For us, it begs the question, why would Turkey want to agree to this? And uh, we'll look at his answer now, and then let's talk about the plan and other plans as well. Well, let's be fair, let's be fair to Turkey. Uh, I mean, they've been hosting, uh, they are the country in the world now with the largest number of refugees. They've been hosting by now 2 million registered Syrians, in addition to a few hundred thousands from other countries. Mm -hmm. They've been offering them access to healthcare, access to schools. They have also closed the land border. This year, almost nobody, I mean, the numbers are below 2,000, were able to cross the land border into Greece and Bulgaria. I mean, very few people. So what we are actually dealing with now is not a Turkish government that is opening and hoping that the problem solves itself by people leaving. They have also been trying to stop people in the Aegean. But it is clear that it's not going to be their top priority and that they are going to invest even more resources. Right. But if the EU would offer credibly to share the burden that in the end Turkey can plan with a million Syrians that it might have to integrate and policymakers in Ankara are aware of this. Mm -hmm. It will be much easier to sell to the Turkish public that, for example, you open the labor market to a million people than that you do it all by yourself. Turkey has an interest, very clearly, that the Orban-style argument, which is essentially anti-Muslim, is not going to be the dominant discourse in the European Union. I mean, if the two countries that have been most generous in the last period towards refugees, which is now Germany and, used, and of course Turkey, if they can work together to preserve the right to refugee, uh, the right uh, to asylum, and make life better for refugees, half of the refugees in Turkey are children of the Syrians. I mean, this is very important. Mm -hmm. If their uh, life can be made better, I mean, this is also something that is in Turkey's interest. Finally, last point, is that the European Union, of course, has a visa liberalization process with Turkey, where issues of borders, asylum, um, and readmission are key. It is very clear that if Turkey becomes such a crucial part for the EU's policy, I mean, the EU should, as soon as possible, lift the visa requirement for Turkish citizens. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think the crisis is manageable. It just needs to be managed. And that's the problem. I haven't seen Europe as a whole approaching it and managing it. They're just pushing the problem to, to different countries and we have a piecemeal kind of politics here. For Christ's sake, in 1956, when we didn't have a European Union and, the country, and, and, and Europe was still uh, damaged from the war, uh, Europe managed to take 200,000 uh, Hungarian refugees in a matter of a few weeks and, and, and integrate them. The, at the, uh, when, when, when Yugoslavia fell apart, the wars produced not many, uh, just slightly fewer refugees than we see now coming. And it was managed because someone was managing it. And now we have the, the, the agglomeration of the most developed and richest countries in the world, the European Union, with half a billion, more than half a billion inhabitants, and they cannot integrate half a million people? This is ridiculous. Well, fine, but that was a plan being proposed, I mean, to take people from Turkey d directly. The question is, what, Philippe, do you think it's realistic? No, no. Yes, I, I just want to add, to add a word about this. Uh, uh, refugees are considered a burden, but they also uh, could be considered an opportunity because they come with uh, their skills, uh, they come with their will to work, uh, they come with many things, including for many of them with financial assets. So uh, the, the, the main issue is how are we going to consider them as people we want to integrate also in the labor market um, to organize the shift from protecting lives to securing livelihoods. I think we have to make this reflection now because... Uh, with the situation becoming protracted, uh, it, it's a reflection Europe must have today. So sticking to the rule of uh, no access to the labor market uh, during nine months is just a nonsense today. Right, but I'd, I'd just like to ask specifically about um, Gerald Knaus's idea there of uh, taking refugees specifically from the camps in Turkey, uh, and that's the only way to get into into, into Europe, and if anybody tries to cross the, the, the borders uh, illegally, 
um, then, then they get sent back. Is that, is that realistic? I mean, you said we haven't got a plan, but that sounds like a plan. Could be implemented, or do you think might be? Well, there should be legal ways to enter Europe, but I don't quite see how it should work that you only take uh, refugees who happen to be in Turkey, but those who might have issues in, in, in Lebanon or in uh, Jordan are excluded per se. This is a bit of a, of a too rigid approach, I think. But the, 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 the whole idea that instead of having these people travel this arduous journey... Uh, create avenues, legal avenues, regulated avenues, how they come, can come to Europe, which would also be a relocation from Turkey, among others, is a good idea. As far as I know about the policy in Turkey, it's, a, it's going to be a great opportunity to invasion in Syria and create there the camps, slowly, slowly, as they are doing the last period. So they will create one more problem. To take people from Turkey, that will be the best the best, but I think they will not do it. They will keep the poor people, they are educating people in Turkey, and they will take from Turkey only the well-educating people and the people that have money, and then again mafia, as they are doing every day, 40 balloon boats, they will bring people in Europe, in Greece, illegally, with $2,000 for uh, every head, and that situation will continue. No. Uh, the things has to clear first from the European Commission what they have in their mind. And they have to say direct now. I think we've completed the answers from, our, uh, from the previous audience uh, question. Is the EU capable of carrying out a cohesive plan to deal with the migrant and refugee crisis? As you'll see, 56.8% says yes, 43.2% say no. So... Uh, well, so, we, so we've got a, like a majority of uh, optimists here, um, but we'll come to you in a minute. But I want to um, uh, come to uh, Nikola Pavasovic. Uh, what's your opinion and how did you vote? I think, yes, it's, uh, the EU is capable. Um, and I'm actually surprised uh, at, to see that many people answered no, because I think if you approach this issue negatively, you're, you have already given up. We have already given up, and how can we fix the problem when we think it's impossible? Uh, however, even though the answer is yes, I think the, the path to cohesive plan is extremely complex, and we can't achieve it when you have uh, conflicting pictures in uh, Germany and Hungary, uh, a completely different uh, approach. So definitely uh, um, uh, something needs to be done in the public perception and the governments in order for a cohesive plan to to pass, so it's a complex issue, but I definitely think yes. I, I like the way you put it, and I like also the result of, uh, of the poll here, because the EU is a complex machine, so uh, you have to make a distinction between the European Commission and the Council. Uh, I'm pretty sure, knowing from within the European Commission, that they are working hard, and they want <laughs> to find a solution, but there is a Council. And then it is another story. You know, it's another story, because you have heads of state uh, fighting with each other. And I cannot predict what will happen. I cannot, because everyone transforms this refugee issue into a challenge in international politics. So uh, it, it's another issue. It has nothing to do with the refugees. So the European Commission works in the right direction, I think, but the Council you cannot predict, because it is internal politics with nothing to do with the refugees. Okay, we have one more video left. Uh, that we'd like to share. And this goes to uh, something that Milita brought up earlier of what the individuals, uh, individual people have stepped up and, and how they're helping the refugees. Let's take a look. Where the governments have failed, the people, as is often the case, have stepped in. A German couple set up a website to match asylum seekers with flatmates, then pay their rent. And it's so successful, they are expanding into other countries as well. An individual bought a 40-meter vessel to patrol waters near Malta, saving thousands of lives at sea. Migrant women, who are already established in Athens, set up a program to provide breakfast for young children in makeshift refugee camps. A young woman on the Greek border rushes to finish her day job to run sandwiches and supplies to the migrants on trains. Sometimes we don't have a lot to offer them, but, she says, we're doing our best. We're going to have to wrap up in a minute, but uh, I'd like to come back to you. I mean, 
it's, you, you've seen this in action, especially you, you two over there, I mean, all, actually all of you, but uh, of uh, ordinary people uh, helping migrants and refugees because they think it's the, the right thing to do. But is that the overwhelming sentiment in your countries, do you think? I have a good impression. In the middle of the summer started an organization called Mixol, which is, uh, they organized it very well. Uh, they, uh, they have a house in front of the train station. They, uh, they give uh, food, sandwiches, water, and the most important things, information for the arrivers. Because we are not talking about uh, the situation in, in this show till this time. That uh, I think the main problem with the, with the arrivers that they don't have any information when they start them route, any correct information. What will happen? And of course, how can they get it? if the countries are changing the, the law day by day, the practice day by day. So that's why they are in, in a very bad position. Of course, uh, they left them uh, born country and, and it, it is more important for, for them to know what will happening. Someday one country closed the border. Next day the other country closed the border. So that's why uh, I think uh, in, in Seged, uh, concretely, and uh, Budapest as well, uh, it was very important, the civil organizations, what they did. I'm proud about solidarity in Greece for the refugees because it doesn't start now. It's two years before. But I'm ashamed for the Greek state of, for the behave because they didn't found any solution for the refugees. And many times the receptions when the people are coming from the sea, everyone is absent. Only local people are there to support the refugees. Um, so I think uh, it doesn't miss now solidarity in all over the country. Solidarity is uh, very huge, but the dignity is missing. We are driving these people to pass five countries, and in every in every country, people are taking advantage to charge more money for the tickets, for foods, for everything. So we are driving these people until Europe almost every day, for, from, from 4,000 people until 8,000 people, some days they are passing from the many 8,000 people. OK. Last words from, from you, Philippe and Melita? Yes, OK. Uh, I, I like very much uh, this last uh, video and solidarity of the Germans. I think that the Germans uh, also have memories of the past and the vision of the future. Memories of the past first. Germany, between 1945 and 1950, welcomed not half a million refugees, but 12 and a half million refugees. And all the Germans know that these refugees were instrumental in rebuilding Germany, post-World War II Germany. So the big economic success of Germany is linked with the refugee movement to Germany. And they have also a vision of the future. They know that the demography is just collapsing and that they will need these people. So they are arriving. You are welcome. And that is, uh, I think, uh, uh, very wise also to see the future like that. Well, I think helping people who are in distress, helping people who are persecuted, is at the very heart of European values. And if I say heart, I really mean it as an emotional issue for many Europeans themselves. This is what we see with all these people who want to help. And I think and I hope that what is coming from as a grassroots movement, this wave of support will eventually grow into uh, and, and, and become a factor in politics as well. OK, well, on, on that note, unfortunately, we must uh, wrap up. But I'd like to thank you, our studio guests and our guests um, in the audience uh, for being with us. Um, that was a very powerful um, hour of discussion. And uh, uh, this is an issue that is clearly going to run and run. Sue? Thank you. Indeed, it was a powerful hour. Thank you at home for joining us on Vicinities Europe, the first pan-European current affairs talk show. Uh, we'll hope to see you back here again where we'll look at other issues of importance to Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you.